spontaneous processes only move a system towards equilibrium. But where is this equilibrium and how quickly can we reach it? And maybe we may also gain work on our way to it, like this Stirling engine does. Yes. Welcome to FISCAM Basics, our topic today, physical equilibrium. Is our system at equilibrium? If not, what is the distance from equilibrium? Equilibrium is a very essential term in thermodynamics. Equilibrium means that there is no change in our system over time. The easiest to describe are temperature and concentration equilibria. This system here is obviously not in thermal equilibrium. The temperature is higher on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. Only after a certain time, at equilibrium, a uniform temperature has been reached. Thus, the equilibrium condition for the system is same temperature everywhere. Temperature difference, temperature gradient in the left picture, may be a measure for the distance from equilibrium. This system has a uniform temperature and still is not at equilibrium, because there is a higher concentration on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. The equilibrium here is defined by another condition, same concentration everywhere. The difference in concentration in the initial state is a measure of the distance from equilibrium. Incidentally, we can discuss chemical equilibria in a very similar way. We have to add another equilibrium condition, which states same chemical potential everywhere. More on that later. If there are temperature differences in a system, heat transfer is provoked. Heat conduction occurs, which is a passive energy transfer without external flow. If there are different concentrations in a system, mass transport provoked. Diffusion occurs, which is passive mass transfer. Both processes are passive. They are summarized under the term conduction. Active transport processes, on the other side, go along with the movements of fluids and are called convection. Thermal conduction can be described quantitatively by Fourier's laws. A temperature gradient in the system is the prerequisite for thermal conduction. In the one-dimensional case, this is dt over dx. The passively transferred amount of heat, quantified by the flux density, is proportional to the temperature gradient. This is the statement of Fourier's first law. Lambda is the thermal conductivity and a measure to quantify the ease with which a particular medium conducts. Metals have a very high thermal conductivity. Liquids, and especially gases, at rest, conduct heat very badly. If the temperature profile is not linear, but has a curvature, we talk about unsteady state or transient heat conduction. In this case, temperature changes do occur in the system, which are described by Fourier's second law. The larger the curvature of the temperature profile, the larger the change in temperature. This is described mathematically by the second derivative. In our example, the arrow marks the location of the largest curvature. Here, the temperature will change the most. In gases at rest, heat is transported by collisions. Accordingly, the thermal conductivity of gases at rest can be explained using the kinetic gas theory. The thermal conductivity of a gas is related to its mean velocity and mean free path. Small and light gas molecules, like hydrogen and helium, do have the greatest thermal conductivity in relative terms. A simple light bulb can be seen as a thermal conductivity detector. The poorer the thermal conductivity of the gas in the bulb, the brighter the filament lights up. This phenomenon is used to detect gases for example, uh, in gas chromatographs. Diffusion is quantified by fixed laws. 
These are completely analogous to Fourier's laws. Diffusion is caused by a concentration gradient, in the one-dimensional case dc over dx. The intensity of the passive mass transport, quantified by the mass flow density, is proportional to the concentration gradient. Where the concentration profile has the largest slope, marked by the red arrow, flux is largest. The coefficient d describes the diffusion in a medium at rest. It is much slower in a liquid than in a gas. With unsteady state or transient diffusion, the concentration in the system changes over time. The change in concentration is proportional to the curvature of the profile. This is Fick's second law. The arrow marks the point of largest curvature in our example. At this point, the concentration will change the most. The diffusion of gases can also be explained with the kinetic gas theory. Again, small and light gases diffuse fastest. Einstein and Smolokovsky were able to explain fixed laws with their random walk model. In particular, they were able to calculate the displacement x. This is a distance to quantify how far a particle moves from its starting point by diffusion. Let's discuss a heat transfer experiment thermodynamically. Consider two subsystems, one liter of water at 100 degrees Celsius and one liter of water at 0 degrees Celsius. After bringing these systems in thermal conduct, eventually thermal equilibrium will be reached with a uniform temperature of 50 degrees Celsius in both of the systems. Using the heat capacity of water, we may easily calculate the transfer heat to be 210 kilojoules. Let's look at this process like a thermodynamicist and discuss it in terms of energy and entropy using the first and the second law. The letter U stands for internal energy. This is a measure of how much energy is inside of a system. The definition of this quantity makes sense because the first law states that the total internal energy of the universe remains constant. We can measure internal energy change of a system by simply adding heat and work which accompanied a process. In every process in which heat or work are involved, the internal energy changes. The elements at 25 degrees Celsius were arbitrarily chosen as the zero level for energy. Let's discuss the thermal equilibrium experiment thermodynamically in energy terms, looking through energy glasses, so to speak, and apply the first law. The originally hot water has lowered its internal energy by 210 kilojoules. The originally cold water increased its internal energy by exactly the same amount, 210 kilojoules. The letter S stands for entropy. Entropy is, in layman's terms, a measure of the disorder or chaos in a system, a measure of energy dispersal of how spread out the energy is. The introduction of this state function makes sense because the second law simply states that the total entropy of the universe can only increase. According to Clausius, the change in entropy of a system can be measured by the so-called reduced heat, Q divided by T, QT. This little QT may serve as a mnemonic for this definition. And help you to remember Clausius' equation. Entropy shows similar dependencies as internal energy, but unlike energy, entropy also depends strongly on dilution. One mole of ideal gas at room temperature has the same energy whether it's at one bar or at two bars pressure. However, the one bar gas has a higher dilution and thus the higher entropy. The zero point of entropy is not arbitrary, but given by nature. The third law of thermodynamics states that in ideal crystals at zero Kelvin, we will have an entropy of zero. Now let's discuss the thermal equilibrium experiment in terms of entropy. 
let's put on our entropy glasses. The entropy of the originally hot water has decreased. We use our QT Clausius equation. We have to integrate because the temperature is not constant and get an entropy decrease of negative 0.6 kilojoules per Kelvin. Using the same equation and plugging in the temperature changes for the other subsystem, we calculate that the entropy of the original cold water has increased, but by a larger amount. Our overall entropy was just generated in the process. This holds for every process in the universe, which is spontaneous. Processes in which the total entropy increases are called irreversible. They can only take place in one direction. Spontaneous heat transfer from hot to cold is irreversible, as just described. Mr. Carnot had thought about how to gain work from this process. He has described a machine that makes this very process, heat transfer from hot to cold, reversible, and thus derives the maximum possible amount of work from it. The Carnot machine is therefore a heat engine, just like a steam engine or a diesel engine or like a Stirling engine. It converts heat into work with the best possible efficiency ether. A Stirling engine is also a heat engine. We have two temperature levels between which heat is transferred and which is converted into work to a certain fraction. We now consider a working cycle of a Carnot machine. Again, looking through our energy and entropy glasses. Let's examine the various subsystems step by step in terms of their energy and entropy change. When the Carnot machine is running, both the internal energy and the entropy of the upper temperature level decrease. The reverse applies to the lower temperature level. The internal energy increases and also the entropy increases. The Carnot machine itself goes through a cycle, so it changes neither energy nor entropy. The surroundings gain work, so they increase their internal energy. However, the entropy of the surroundings remain constant. According to the first law, the exchanged energies must add up to zero. Energy can neither be generated nor destroyed. According to the second law, entropy can never decrease. That means the sum of the entropy amounts must be greater than or equal to zero. The Carnot machine works ideally reversible, which means that the total entropy change is zero. By combining these two equations, we get the Carnot efficiency eta to delta t over t sub i. This is one of the most important equations in thermodynamics. It limits the conversion of heat into work. The temperature difference between the temperature levels of a heat engine determines the efficiency. A heat engine with the two temperature levels 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius therefore has an efficiency of approximately 25%. 100% heat from the high temperature level is only converted to 25% of work. The remaining 75% heat flows as waste heat into the low temperature level. Let's summarize. The conductive transport processes of thermal conductivity and diffusion can be described by similar laws. These are Fourier's laws and fixed laws. Small and light gas particles show both the largest heat conductivity and diffusion coefficient. While the complete conversion of work into heat is not a problem, the conversion of heat into work is only possible with a certain efficiency. According to Carnot, this efficiency cannot exceed delta t over t sub i. More information about the topic you'll find in the book and in the lecture. Thanks for watching.